And now, coming to you from the Pensado Media Center, powered by Westlake Pro. Deep, deep rocker DNA from today's guest. He will share. The Indaba Converse Mix Contest is absolutely on fire. We've got a brand new ITL from the Master Blaster. JD, hit the ignition, please. You're at the place. It's Pensado's place. Yeah. So glad you guys could stop by. Um, I've had an interesting week, a wonderful week, hanging out with buddies and friends and renewing my... Uh, a lot of people in town. My love of gear. A lot yeah. of events, yeah. a lot of gears. You tired? No. No. Quite the opposite. Yeah, it's pretty pretty uh, invigorating, correct? Yeah. yeah. So we got a lot of stuff to get to. Should we get to it? Let's do it. All right, let's do that. Hey, everybody, it is great to be with you. By the way, did you hear about the lady who attacked her husband with some guitars? She was arraigned, and the judge said, first offender? And she said, no, first a Gibson, then offender. <laughs> That was for you. That was guitar humor just for you. <laughs> Could you see it coming? Uh, sort not, of. No, I, 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 right before the punchline, so it was very effective. It, it, it's it kind was of, funny. It's kind of it's funny. White House Correspondents Dinner, the audio version. Joe, how'd you like that one? That's for uh, Joe. Well, got, well, he's the pro, so he's... Back to the matters at hand. Thanks for your likes and subscribes. Keep them up if you would. They are the wind beneath our wings. Our partners, the always incredible Blackbird Academy, Vintage King, DTS... Lander, Audio Technica, Avid, Recording Connection in Studio 202 DC. The Indaba Converse Rubber Tracks Mix Contest is off to an absolute roaring start. Over 1,200 entrants, already 170 mixes submitted. Do not miss this. There's some very cool treats for those who kick behind with their mixes. Grand prize, an appearance on Pensado's Place. That could be Skype or Live. Plus, you win a UAD Apollo Twin Duo Interface. That's provided by Westlake Pro plus a $250 gift card certificate from Converse Rubber Tracks. That's not all. Second place gets Ozone 7 from Isotope and a $250 gift certificate. And for three runner-ups, you get Isotope's trash plug-ins. But if you think that's all, it wouldn't be Pensadia. Not only will Dave Pensado and Aaron Bastinelli from Converse Rubber Tracks judge the final mixes, there's a popular vote as well. First three popular vote winners get free upgrades to Indaba Pro status. Now, how do you get to all this goodness? Rush, 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 right now to the URL you see right below me. Enter right away. Join Indaba for free. The song is Distance by Hot Indie Band Regret the Hour. Download that puppy, get to mixing, submitting, and winning. You only have two more weeks. Do not delay. You're going to be judging that, correct? Uh, yeah, I, I can't wait. I love this song, by the way. Really cool, yeah. right? It's just, a cool just band. real quick, guys. What I do is I've got ten categories like uh, inventiveness, uh, EQing skills, compressing skills, and I and I do a one to ten for each individual. And then of those ten, a hundred will be perfect. And I go through the top twenty, and mm -hmm. I listen to them all again, and mm -hmm. I keep narrowing it down like that. So do there's do, a method to this. Do you do plating as well? <laughs> <laughs> so I'm just curious, you know, you put your culinary skills to, to work as well, too. So again, to get to this goodness, enter this URL right behind me. Enter, mix, win, and collect. We want to yeah. see you there. Now, here's this week's audio assignment. Go get your calendars. Go get them out right now. Go, we'll wait. We'll, we'll wait. It's a guy in Greece. He's sort of slow. We have to wait on him. You, you ready? Okay, cool. Everybody's got their calendars. June 11th, write it down. Gear Expo LA is on and popping at the beautiful Vintage King facility. Downtown Hipster LA, there will be gear, there will be beer, food trucks, showrooms, giveaways, scholarship, toys, plenty of parking. It is the only audio block party in the business. We created it. This is about the fifth one, and it is an absolute jam. Audio stars you can meet, you better believe it. You know we're going to bring you stuff. Our hit maker panel. Josh Goodwin, super hot with his Bieber records and A&R Chops. Aubrey Big Juice Delane of Nicki Minaj fame. Jake Sinclair of Panic at the Disco, Weezer, and Sia. Rocker Giants are being added. Can't tell you this week. We'll tell you next week. We have a Flix panel. So if you care about TV and film, how about these guys? Fred Archambault from Last Call with Carson Daly. He'll be there. Very smart guy. Joseph McGee, the audio guru for the $100 million franchise, Pitch Perfect. 
Um, we're going to do some interesting things with the movie. He'll be there. And next week, we're going to add an Oscar nominee. If he calls now, I'll add him before I stop talking <laughs> right now. But we're going to add one of those guys. An Electronica panel will feature Sidebrain and three or four others. And we're not just going to lecture, but also going to perform. More of that to come. And finally, the OG panel. Now, OG for us is not original gangster. Well, could be for you and I. <laughs> but we call them the original giants. These are men and women who set the bar, know all the tricks, work with all the superstars. You want to meet these folks, get their wisdom, and get to hang with you. It's fun in the sun, hot gear, hot people. Dave and I want to see you, sign an autograph, take a picture with you. Yeah. How do you do that? Go to thegearexpo.com, thegearexpo.com. Enter. It's free. Prepare to party, win, and learn. Do not delay. First come, first serve. This boy could fill up fast, so yeah, I'm telling it will you. will fill up fast. While I'm talking to you, you need to be filling in stuff. Um, so let's get there. It's going to be a good one. Now it's time to meet the hotshot Hungarian with harmful hair. He goes by the name of... <laughs> Jungle. I was looking for H's this morning. And your hair is a little harmful. I guess Here, so, man. Well, there's a cultural thing. Chongor, and you see he puts up the Hungarian flag. Know, he does it. It, so Chongor, he crossed the uh, a cultural Rubicon last uh -huh. week. He went to me with the black barber shop. Oh, really? Yeah. Like that, Good time. That's, what, that's all you could say. You couldn't say anything else. And she said, and she said, you know, baby, I cut white hair, too. And I just wanted to see how Chongo would respond. He did pretty good. Did she cut your hair? No, next no. time. Uh -oh. But on the way out, he gave a pound to everybody on the Was way Cedric out. Was Cedric the entertainer there talking about the no. Harlem Globetrotters? Just me. Oh. That, that's all. <laughs> so, Chongo, we got, we got uh, questions for our guests? So many questions. Everyone yeah. wants to know some stuff from him. How about your reaction when you came from his studio on Sunday? He called me. Chongo was having full-on audio meltdown. Oh, my God. So much gear. I was in heaven. It was just like... You go there, live there, not even come out. Yep, yep, yep. It's hard to walk in there and talk to Joe because you'll see something. Oh my God, Joe, is that a? Yeah, and, and then, he goes. Oh, yeah. Joe, is that a? Yeah, yeah, I use that on the Chevelle rig. Oh yeah, yeah, I use that on the Slipknot rig. Oh yeah, yeah, I use that on the Melon rig. That's, that's that guy. That's not Joe. Joe's too humble for that. But so, so Chongo, another thing too. Last week you were noodling around as you do, as you want to do. Um, and you ran across some metrics for our show. You want to tell tell yeah. folks about those metrics? Well, so since the inception of the show about 78 episodes into it, we're at 101 million minutes of content watched on YouTube. So that's a Google metric. Google metric from YouTube. It's Over 101 million minutes consumed of Pensado's yep. Plus, which does not include the first 77 episodes. Yeah, or, or iTunes or Facebook. So if you average the first 77 episodes, we'd be about 100, you, you and I did the math, yeah, we'd be about 150. 159 million minutes yep. consumed. Yeah. That's so a that lot means with the other places where we're uh, available it'd be around 300 million yeah because that's half of our metrics yeah that's crazy what what's the number that's consumed just this year i think we're about nine million since nine, january nine, nine million minutes of content watched wow unbelievable that's because of you guys and uh we couldn't be more grateful to you and humbled by it and we tell you all the time the power of this community is widespread and runs very deep uh, we discovered it, and we know what to do with it, and then we just want to thank you Earlier for that. Earlier I said, who are these people? And and one of the things about the live events that, that, that's so important to Herb and I, and, and we want you to show up, is because it lets us know who these people are. Yeah. We want to meet you. We want you to see you at the four or five live events we're doing this year. Absolutely. It's and very important to us because it's your show, yeah. and it helps us tailor to your needs. And you get free stuff. We give stuff away. Yeah. We give lots of stuff away. So make sure you go to the things we yeah. talked about earlier. We've got another one we're going to tell you about in the body of the show. So special ITL. You worked on it all Sunday. Um, yeah, very what, special. What do we have? Well, I was at Joe Barisi's, and Joe's going to show us how to record rock guitars for all genres. Cool. Roll it. From time to time, I get guitar sounds when I'm mixing that kind of box me into a specific sound and that sound every once in a while is not as good as it could be. So I took the opportunity to talk to my friend Joe Barisi. Joe, welcome. Dave, oh, nice I, actually, you should say welcome to me. I'm in your welcome facility. To my lair. Yeah. <laughs> and uh, I said, Joe's going to help us out. Uh, the workshops that you do, you, you, you go into this in a little more depth than the pro sound workshops, right? We do, yeah. We go into, um, into a lot of detail in two-day workshops and um, uh, drums, guitars, mixing everything, but 
uh, it's a lot of fun actually. Yeah. How uh, uh, well, philosophically, what is a good guitar sound? Uh, a rock guitar sound, like let's say, let's say we're not talking about the rock world, a good guitar sound, but say a, an R and B song or a, or a, a hip hop song, or even a pop song. It, I, I'm I like that that humbucker through a Marshall sound, but sometimes they take up too much space. How can you imply that power of a rock guitar inside a, a different medium, genre? Um, I think for me in general, a good guitar sound has some low end. I think a lot of people shy away from the bottom. So I'm like you, I'm a fan of the humbucker through the Marshall and it, it does it does give you a full frequency you know, as opposed to a Strat, I, I think a Strats and Tele's, I more think a clean guitar, mm -hmm. and Les Pauls and Humbucker, Marshall. Um, so for me, it has to have a little more bottom, but like you say, it does take up a lot of space, and I, I think um, how you can get more power out of something like that is by pushing a little more air. I mean, it doesn't necessarily have to have all that super low end, or when you're mixing, sometimes you think about pushing the bass above the guitar. Right. Most people think the other way around. The bass is really the bottom, and the guitar sits higher. But that's the way I thought. I mean, sometimes I treat it as the guitar is really reaching down that's low, and the bass is really kind of in the mid range in a way. And you can always generate some sub bass, you know, right. when you're when you're mixing. Obviously, you're master of bottom. Um, I always pull up your presets too, and I'm <laughs> Renaissance bass and things like that. <laughs> oh right my God! Pensato preset. Yeah, when you do, be careful about the input. I, I probably got a little loud on that one, but I, I use it all the time to synthesize notes that disappear too. Which yeah, is, it's great for Same stuff thing. like that. Um, it, in terms of the performance element of it, I've always kind of felt, um, and not just me, the world of guitar players when you're the more distortion you're using the fewer strings you need to play is that still an adage that you think would help us here yeah i i, I think um a lot of times it's easy to play dirty and most people think the dirty is you know a bigger heavier sound but actually it's the cleaner the acdc type yeah i was just thinking you know, of that. where you where you if you have the opportunity to play the part through a cleaner amp or less gain, um, being able to play harder and getting more of the power amp distortion and speaker distortion as opposed to, um, you know, fizz through a distortion pedal. That doesn't necessarily make things bigger. It's really the the clean power that that most people realize. It's like most people don't realize that the cleaner the amp, actually, it could sound heavier. Um. Some of the some of the more recent records you've done that that catch my ear, the new Slipknot, Queens of the Stone Age, some of those records is the is the '60s concept that we all kind of adopted from uh, from England, where if you if you want a big sound, go to a smaller amp. Is that still part of the process? You mentioned about about taking uh, an, an amp almost identical to this, throwing it in a throwing yeah. it in a, a cooler and being part of a Queens of the Stone Age sound. Yeah, I mean, on, on Lullaby's record, we actually had a little Marshall micro stack and put it inside of like an igloo cooler. And at that <laughs> time, we were like super into using unconventional, unconventional uh, means of recording. Yeah. So, you know, you'd cut the XLR off and fish the cable through the spigot and re-solder it back on. And then we were using these blue mics called the Ball. Oh, yeah. That's like just kind of crazy, but lovely. But we were, we were striving for a different kind of sound. So um, he, he's surprising, you know. I mean, realistically, when you when you see bands play live and they're playing, and you see you know sixteen half stacks. Uh -huh. Really, they might only have a single twelve mic'd underneath or the stage. Or they might be cardboard. Or exactly. So the idea of using something small like this and. With a microphone in front of this, you know, I mean, it's this these, is, are, these are affordable too. You said that you use cheap. these. These are actual little amps built into cigarette cases around fifty bucks, and you said that these make their way onto a lot of records too. These are are um, actually the the whole idea behind this was always trying to get feedback in the control room. So I was looking for a way to split the guitar signal into something that was manageable, where you didn't have another amp blasting you in the face the whole time. So I thought, why, why not get a little amp? We were talking earlier about yeah. the little Radio Shack white amplifiers, oh, and, and yeah. this sort of the same concept. I'll take a, a feed off of this, you and were, hold it in front of your guitar pickup, and get all kinds of crazy feedback. Let me do some going. hand puppets here. You were you were playing it like this, 
so you could hold this close to the pickup and get some feedback. Exactly. That was, that was amazing. Did and you this smoke? will actually power a 412. I mean, no it's, it's serious. I mean, it's there's enough juice in there when the battery's working. And you actually smoked the cigarettes that came in these, didn't you? Um, well, you know, I'm a, more of a camel guy. Oh, look, there's so a battery in there. There it is. That's where it goes. <laughs> Damn, but, man. You know, things like this is something that you could do at home. You don't necessarily have to own uh, What is a this company? High. They're called Smokey. I don't <laughs> even know if they're still in business, but I'm sure they're all over the internet. And um, <laughs> there's so many of these little kinds of amps. I mean, Marshall still makes mm -hmm. micro stacks and the high, you know, high watts and fenders. And, and that, that actually, the, the one modeled after the Watkins Dominator actually has a fairly good tremolo in it. Wow. Really good. And a little echo, too. So. In terms of um, let's don't let's don't call them mistakes, but in terms of um, getting closer to what their intended purpose for a guitar is, what are what are some solutions for getting too much of that buzzy top end? Is is it just understanding you don't need it? Um, you know, I think a lot of well, for, I mean, for me, a lot of problems in the recording process stem from the fact that you don't know what you're really hearing. So. It all really comes back oh, down to deep. your, you know, it comes back to your listening environment. You might not ever hear all that buzzy top end because your your speakers are, you know, so bright in general that that's what you're used to hearing, or or your speakers are so dark that you're adding so much of that. So so it really comes down to the source, what, how you're translating it. But I think excitement generally translates with high end. I mean, who doesn't want to hear something that's a little bit brighter and snappier and that yeah. makes it excited. So your tendency is to, especially on guitars, but realistically, I mean, what does a guitar speaker put out at the top of its range? 4K? Yeah, I mean, if, if that. So, uh, I mean, cranking 12K on a guitar is pretty well useless. Yeah. I mean, maybe you're getting some kind of harmonic somewhere. And what's your thought on, speaking of harmonics, what's your thoughts on, on odd and even harmonics? Are, are you, can can they get a good sound with a transistor emulation? I guess these are transistors. Yeah, those are good all sound. transistors. They're probably FETs, which has a more of a even har more of an odd harmonic. I think the key there is the fact that it's actually coming out of a speaker. So it's whether the speaker is a good speaker or a crappy speaker, it's still coming out of a speaker, and there's some kind of air motion. And um, there's a microphone, so now you're adding another flavor, and then. Out of that microphone has to go to a preamp, whether it's a Mackie preamp or a Neve preamp, doesn't matter. It's a flavor of a preamp. So I think part of that routing, as opposed to slapping a plug in on something and just turning a knob and there's your distortion, there's really no kind of air moving at all. Just something as simple as that, or you know, just adding a little bit of that flavor in makes a bigger sound, a more usable sound, especially when you're mixing too. You don't necessarily need a, a clean DI guitar. To reamp when you're mixing, you just—I mean, we never we even called it reamping back then. We used to just <laughs> no. take the signal and turn the fader down, or go into a compressor. Yeah, just and, run it out there is what we call and, it. And you'd want to change the sound anyway, so you'd do right. whatever it took. And that's you know, I always say that's why there's EQ with plus 15 and minus 15 on it because you sh you yeah. can and <laughs> will use that. If you look at yeah. my console, you'll see some of that on there. Yeah. I, um, I, I just recently, by the way, found out that faders can move down. I thought they only moved in one wow. direction. Oh, yeah, they only go down after you bump them up for a ride. <laughs> <laughs> um, what's your take on, and we'll, we'll end, end with this, what's your take on, on the state of virtual guitar amps, software guitar amps? Uh, UAD's making some good ones. There's a lot of good ones out there. Have you found that to be a viable alternative for, for a person working at home? And yeah. Do you uh, have any, any suggestions on on a, an affordable one? Um, I, I will say that I try them all because I'm always curious as to what's gonna, you know, maybe replace reamping through a Marshall or, mm -hmm. or whatever. And, and for me, it's still a combination of going into a head and using maybe a speaker emulator. So it's, I could be super lazy and not have to go mic it or mm -hmm. in the middle of the night, not worry about waking anybody up. But, there are, Scuffman makes some good stuff. My friend James Santiago works for UA, and he's he's been here on many occasions. What I love about him is we've done a lot of tests. We'll listen to multiple amps and try to emulate it. We'll take direct out of the back of heads and EQ them to try to make them is sound there like the a, real a deal. UA that you find? I, I actually don't have any UA plugins, so I can't tell you. <laughs> but I do have. I mean, I've tried the Scuffman stuff. It's cool. The Positive Grid guys have some interesting yeah. stuff. 
you know, the classic one for me is Waves GTR, man. I still, I use the hell out of that on everything, whether it's a guitar or a vocal or drums. Mm -hmm. I think that they're emulations of an old Tube Screamer and an overdrive and the delays and the reverbs. I, I just mixed something where a guy was combining the Waves GTR, I had a vibrato and a spring reverb together. Wow. And it would create a little warble into the spring reverb and it's such a great, unique sound. So. Wow. The, the waves, you know, the classic Sansan plug-in, I still use that because yeah, it's so flexible. Too. I mean, just the four knobs are so flexible from a clean sound to a super yeah. dirty sound. It's just, um, yeah, so I, I you know, amp-wise, I think I've pretty much tried them all. I still, in a bind, I'll go for a Sans amp because it's easy. But yeah. Waves GTR is fantastic too, cool. I think. So Joe, Thanks for sharing this with us. Uh, learned a lot today. <laughs> um, you think you think you do this for a minute and you play guitar, but there's always something new to learn, right? Isn't there? I learn every day, man. I you know just talking to you for a few minutes and just uh, you know, it just re-inspires you to yeah. reevaluate what you do. Also, I mean, it yeah. really is. It, I think that's what keeps you growing. It's a good it's a good good thing to be. I always enjoy hanging out with you. Well, thank you um, for coming, Dave. Man, my pleasure. It's always inspirational. I, I, I'm going to dig out my old Radio Shack white speaker now, too. I know, <laughs> I know where it is. It's in the trunk of guitar pedals over there. Uh, so in a couple of weeks, March, I mean, excuse me, May 14th, 14. you're doing your first live stream. That's got to be a little a little nerve-wracking and a, and a lot of... Uh, it is. Um, my partner, Chad Bamford, and I, we... Um, We've hosted a bunch of workshops, and we, we've tried to develop a community of, uh, you know, it really comes down to getting stuff to mix and hearing it and just saying, wow, this could be so much yeah. better, and, and how do you impart that knowledge, which is disappearing, you know, fast. And, and so that's uh, going to be May 14th, yeah, which is uh, a Saturday? Saturday, May 14th, and it's going to be on a specific topic. When we, when we do the workshops, it's usually two days. This is going to be a three-hour on demand. What's the topic? As well, splitting guitars. So multiple oh. guitar cabinets, cabinets and heads and combos together, multiple microphones, getting kind of the why and the how and what to look for. And Wouldn't you say the, the end to the, <coughs> excuse me, the end to the lair that, that you guys just watched, that's a, that's a good topic to have under your belt, that, that skill set, so you can actually improve some of your guitar sound. So, we're also going to touch on direct with uh, real speaker and getting the phase right between those two because that's a super important thing too. I think it's super easy to, to record direct guitars with a speaker emulator, um, but to be able to use an actual speaker and get the two in phase with each other, you can get some really great guitar tones. Well, man, I can't wait. So um, prosoundworkshop.com, uh, I promise you, Joe is, there's none better. Um, you're going to learn a lot. And uh, I'm pretty sure that if, if you can't make a record as good as Joe, he'll refund part of the money, right, Joe? I'll give it all back. <laughs> That's not true. You, it's, it's interactive, too, which is great. So if you have oh. specific questions, we're going to be able to, you'll be able to pick Chad and I's brain. And, um, and, you know, we also go beyond, th we really do want you to learn and get the answers that you're looking yeah. for, so it's not just a one-time. I tell you, amigo, I, I listen to your records and I learn just from uh, from listening to the records, so I can't imagine having you actually imparting some of the information that you've gathered over the years, um, how that can't be anything but just incredibly instructive. Next time. He's just a rock stud, hugely respected and admired in our community, a great friend of the show, a great friend to everybody, and his chops are sublime. Welcome to our desk, our good friend, Joe Barisi. What up, bro? Joe. Hey. How, How are you, man? man? All the way from oh, Pasadena. Right. Ah, old <laughs> people. Oh, all right. I got my, glass, I got my glasses in my lap. <laughs> good stretch. I'm trying not to good move. That was Dave's exercise for the <laughs> good. Thank you for that. <laughs> no, I got weighted cards. Joe. You said a while back, and I love this quote, every penny I've ever made went to audio gear, went back into audio gear. Every penny you've ever made went back into audio gear. Pretty much. Um, my, my dad always used to say, it takes money to make money. So every, you know, I mean, you, you, um, you make some money on a record, you go out, you buy an amp, you buy a pedal, you buy a microphone, whatever. And 
Well, you must have made a lot of money because you got a lot of gear. <laughs> I tell you, well, pre-eBay is when I scored all my deals. So, you know, <laughs> you can buy uh, a couple of ADR vocal stressors for 200 bucks each, and now they're 2,500 bucks each. So. Wow. So would, your, your your gear is actually an investment at this stage of the game. Well, I mean, I'm not maybe, maybe it's worthless at this stage of the game. I well, don't know. Uh, I mean, based on Chongor's reaction to it, it's there's one guy who would just fall on his sword. It, I, I would I would say that that quality top mm -hmm. quality vintage audio gear is one of the best investments on earth. Mm -hmm. It's it's like in, it's like investing in art. Mm -hmm. It just keeps mm -hmm. going up and up and up. I got mm -hmm. some I got some EQs I paid twenty five bucks for, in. 92 and they're worth like a thousand now mm -hmm. api mm -hmm. 550s oh yeah i so, mean i think i paid a grand though so mine are worth nothing we need a loan i know some financial people can i no just to you so here you are you got a lot going on yeah. one of the things that where you know we've been talking about the philosophical side of audio a little bit first of all your rock chops and cred how many years have you focused on the in that space and because there's just so many art great artists you've done um Probably 20 or so. No joke. Yeah. And I mean, I tried to branch out. I just don't think anybody really wants to hire me to do other stuff. But, you know. <laughs> well, that brings up two interesting questions. So one, the evolution over 20 years, and then also tell me if you were to branch out where you'd go. What, what have you question. seen in the rock space over 20 years? Is well, I, you know what? I, actually, when we talked about um, doing heavy guitars or rock guitars in urban music, and I just thought, man, it wouldn't be great if you just hired the rock guy to do rock guitars on a song and then the rock bo or the mm -hmm. urban vocalist to do vocals and then just kind of mix and mix match. All that up. Like yep. Eddie did on Beat It. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Or, yeah, yeah. I mean, there's there's so many, I mean, just the techniques that you bring to the table could make the song it or the artist. It makes for interesting and, stuff, yeah. And you meet other people and, yep. and you keep, kind of create keep the community going as opposed to sit in my little dark dungeon over there. <laughs> a hundred years ago in my record executive days, I spent a lot of time in the Geffen camp, Tom Zutant and all those guys, and it was the Guns N' Roses heyday and all that stuff, and um, Tommy Lee wanted so badly to drum on black records, and his reps used to, because I was working at a black record company, and he used to just say, hey man, I'm available, you know, back when session drummers were available, because mm -hmm. he just knew that that, that thing to the table. would, absolutely, I, I completely agree with yeah, that. I mean, you that first Motley Crue record too, he plays some exceptional stuff and I think he would be re-inspired as opposed to kind of working yeah. on the same type of music all the time. I, I try to find ways to reinvent myself, but you have to. I would totally love for someone like Dave to say, hey, check out what I'm doing on a vocal. Can you add to the table? I think oh, man, collaboration. Let's oh, let's do it. It man, keeps the, uh, keeps the, the competition fresh, going yeah, too, you know yeah. what I mean? And the, the knowledge that you can pass through each other is insane. So, so on, on the evolution side, between how you record, being in the box versus outside the box, all that kind of stuff. Are those some of the changes that you've seen? I, you know, I, yeah. I mean, for me, the the in the box isn't really a negative thing mm -hmm. or a, you know, a or a strictly positive thing either. It's just it's, just it's another tool. tool. Yeah. And it's here you go. Here's a bunch of you know things at your disposal and how you use them is sort of what differentiates right. everybody. So right. Hey, here, but I got a question for you. Okay. How did genres start? Was it a radio thing? Cause, cause, I don't know. Because um, like, it seems like in the 30s, it was just music. It was different types. But it seemed like when radio came along, except well, for European radio, like British radio played everything. But American radio, didn't it compartmentalize to sell Buicks well, and stuff? It, yeah, it had to to sell things. Um, in some cases, there was a racial component. You know, the black charts had been called a number of different things. There were times where music was called race music, and that kind of specificity, I think, um, had a lot to do with economic stuff. So if you were a race artist, you worked here, you your records were played here, they were sold here, and uh -huh. not in other places. I don't think it was just race, but those uh -huh. categories not only made sense to folks back then, but also we've seen how they have limited things, uh -huh. and the people who break through sort of bust those doors wide yeah, because Ray Charles was doing country records. Absolutely. But they call it rhythm and blues, but it didn't mean what it meant now. It meant uh, if, if you go back and the Motown sound was pop music, and yeah. there was just so many, there were so many things. FM radio, in my opinion, became the melange where everybody said, screw that. Let's put Steely Dan up against Earth, Wind, and Fire, up against something else, and we all kind of coexisted. Can you do that little gesture again? Yeah, sure. It's a, <laughs> 
No, it's the called, other one. No, I can't. That's, that's <laughs> X-rated. It's called gesticulation. You know, the, you know what the FCC's been doing to us lately. That, oh, no question. No question. Um, they're, they're, they're cool with us. So, so question for you. The, one of the things we've talked about recently was learning. And the idea of being able to learn as an active verb. You know, you know we're involved in curriculum series and what happens yeah. with the show and doing all that kind of stuff. And you, he called us and said, hey, I'm doing this event. And we were like, no, because he wanted to have a sponsor. And we were like, no, let's, Joseph, tell us about the event, what you're doing, how it yeah. works. Um, well, uh, my partner, Chad Bamford, and I, we've started doing these workshops. We call it Pro Sound Workshop. And it basically is a uh, two-day session. And we do one on drums, one on recording guitars, one on mixing, blah, blah, blah. Mm -hmm. We've decided to, to uh, make a topic very specific. And this one is going to be uh, called Splitting Guitars, which is basically about multiple guitar amps, multiple mics and things. And mm -hmm. we're going to stream it this time. So it's nice. our first foray into streaming. So uh, I appreciate your guys' help. And uh, How do people sign on? Where do they go? Uh, to our website, uh, prosoundworkshop.com. Okay. And um, it'll be on May 14th in two weeks. Or it, week and you're and teaching all these, you and your partner teach Yeah, them. we teach them. And the beauty is he, he does a lot of live stuff, and he works strictly in the box. And I work mostly outside in a, hi in a hybrid setting. But the, mm -hmm. he was uh, one of my assistants for many years at A&M. So he came through a great pedigree and is a great producer and engineer and mixer himself and has a whole other area of knowledge. And together, I think uh, what we do is kind of it works together, and we tried to create a community. So, we, I mean, we still field phone calls and try to make better music, better recordings, which is, I think, what you started doing as well. Yeah. I mean, yeah. So, it, so I'll be able to call in live to the. Studio? Yeah, you can call in and, and ask me a question if you want. Wow. <laughs> uh, you should make an appearance. You should make it. Yeah, it's up to you. May 14th. Yeah. Oh, I'll be in town. Yep. I'm there. Okay, awesome. So promote that. That'd be great. I also uh, got a little taste, Chandra and Leandro got a little taste yesterday about the course. Man, I might not just be there, I might be a participant from the perspective from the perspective of a You're spectator. A good day today, aren't you? <laughs> I overslept. <laughs> <laughs> I, you know, I, I could time my medications better, I guess, next time. So the the here's we get something really spectacular out of the response from people who say they learn. We didn't know that would happen to us when we started mm -hmm. this. Like there's there's this reciprocity in yeah. it that beyond whether you're trying to build a business or do whatever the case may be, there's something about after all these years being able to sort of give it back, have somebody react and did same for you? Same for yeah, you. I mean it really came out of um, just interviewing people that wanted to work for me when I got my own studio and I, and I would take them out to coffee and just start grilling them on their knowledge and why they got into it because we all know why we got into it. We love music and, and we wanted to create sound and, and, and some people just, you know, the ones that really shined to me were the ones that knew their, their favorite album where it might have been made, what kind of console it was on, they were yeah. really using their ears and those are the ones that I thought I mean, this is this is really great, but these other, you know, areas we could focus on. I mean, I, I've read so many books on recording, but until you actually do it yourself and use your ears, and, mm -hmm. and you some know. people just don't know. Yeah. So, so it's a way for us to just to try to make better recordings as well. I mean, it's as, as a mixer, you know, we're just like, wow, this could be so much better, mm -hmm. and and mm -hmm. how can we make this better? Well, you've made it available to so many people. I, I learn when I watch you about certain plugins that I want to learn about. I go, what's Dave think about this plugin? And <laughs> when I when I pull up my Waves plugin, I'd look for the Pensado preset instantly. Oh so, God. so you know what I mean. Like so, so having that um, the ability to share that knowledge, which you know is, I think is important as well, just because it could disappear at some point. Uh, absolutely, Joe. Before we get into a little bit deeper dive into some techniques, um, I was thinking earlier. These techniques are not just rock centric or guitar centric or drum centric. But, I mean, what law says you have to use a guitar technique only on guitars? Why can't you use it on a Wurlitz or a synthesizer? Um, we were talking about uh, Eddie running uh, a, a, a um, Leslie through a Marshall amp. Yeah. Uh, I mean, there's no rules, and, and probably an advantage to have something on the radio that sounds a little different than everything else on the radio. So, in, in Knowing that, I want you to pay, pay attention not just to the subject matter in terms of <clears throat> the particular instrument, 
that we're talking about, but the technique and, and how it can apply to a number of things. And when you do something unique, let us know, because we'll try it too. Um, your monitoring situation, I learned something from you yesterday. Um, not only do you use several monitors sitting in front of your console that Hugh Padgham used for some of my favorite records ever at Townhouse, um, but you also sometimes select a different monitor to get a different mix sound. I yeah. thought that was kind of genius, but... That makes sense. I mean, when I, when I was first sense. working with the, the band called Queens of the Stone Age, they, they actually weren't called Queens <laughs> of the Stone Age back really? then. There, there was no name. They actually, uh. the name came up on the very last day of mixing, but huh. it was going to be, I thought we should try to make something unique and then try to shop it and get a deal. So how do you make something unique? Well, if you work on the same kind of gear all the time, so we, we worked in a different studio, but there was only really a few different sets of monitors and there were some EV sentries there. And I thought, when does anybody use EV sentries? Maybe they used to use EV sentries. I personally have never used any. So I basically recorded and mixed the whole record on EV sentries because mm. I wanted it to sound different mm -hmm. than anything else as opposed Did to it? using, can sound completely different, I think, anyway. Good different? Good different, unique different. Enough where somebody says this band has a sound you know, obviously, I'm, I'm not taking the credit for the sound, but the, the recording itself sounds different than a lot of things that might have just all been done on NS10s or back then or a tone. And, so. and that, that speaks to a trust and integrity between you, the band, you and the band, and whoever else the gatekeepers are to allow yeah. you to... I used to do that with Dave, with my clients. I'd be like, bloop, handle it and do... And Dave would replace drums and so on and so forth. That luxury is something that's earned over time, right? Yeah. And it allows you to... Was, was this the first time you worked with the band? Yeah, because they were unsigned, and I had done a couple wow. of Caius records. And, and actually, I, would, I got hired to do a super, at that time in my life, a very large record with a lot of money. And I wasn't really into the music. And then Josh from the band called and said, hey, this is my new project. Um, are we, I'm going to self-finance it. Are you interested? And he sent me a cassette tape, and uh, I put the first song on. I was like, "All right, done. Let's do this. Let's do this. Let's go to the desert, make a good record with some friends, and and with no intention of it ever going anywhere because we had no idea. It was just it was self finance There was no label behind it, but making something different and that sort of it, it was a good career. <laughs> yeah, move, it's just you know? it just turned into Queens of the Stone Age. That, yeah, just just yeah. worked a little. Yeah. Absolutely. When you're, oh, sorry. Go no, ahead. go ahead. Go ahead. When you're mixing, do you, uh, do you do you keep your level constant the whole time, or do you like, like I like to EQ at a higher level than I'm doing levels. So if I'm doing levels, yeah. I drop I, it down a little bit. I think um, I fluctuate throughout the day. I start out, I need the juice and to feel it, so I turn it up when I need to EQ to hear the low end, and then at some point during the day or after however long your your ears are getting a little tired, you. I take it down. I put it on the NS10 sometimes, or a pair of little uh, op minimus sevens, and oh, yeah. and low volume for balancing. Mm. I mean, it's important, I think, to balance at a low yeah, level. It's so hard too. for me to EQ at a low level. I, I always try it. Yeah, I add too much mid range when I do. Yeah, I never. I, I'm like, I need too much top end. I don't mm -hmm. hear the high end at that small volume. I so we crank the top, and then it just comes out way too bright. So, um, well, one of the things I hear on your records that that I've only recently felt like I'm doing it well is um, your use of filters because I initially <clears throat> early in my career I thought why would you use a filter you're just rolling off some top rolling off some low that how can that help but uh, you and Eric Valentine are probably masters at that how do you use filters and how can the guy at home benefit from that knowledge um, I, you know what I, I never used to when I, I started working mostly on an old Neve and it was only really you know, there's minimal EQ, so you got to really learn that EQ, and it wasn't fully parametric, obviously, so you, you got into frequencies, and you knew I could boost here, cut here, but the filter was the one thing that kind of tied it all together, especially on an old Neve, you needed to take some of that tubbiness out of the bottom. Mm -hmm. The thing I realized about, and I never really thought about it till I actually started using McDSP F2. Me too. You know, I'm just like, Me hey, too. there's That's a resonant peak here, so not only can I cut the top, or cut the bottom, I can actually add some EQ with that resonant peak. And yeah. depending on how you can slide it around, you can really focus a yeah. bass note or a kick drum we talked about earlier, like the voice of God. Yeah. Um, or so, even, even, I've been using it sometimes on on vocals that I want to be a little more aggressive, like I'll, 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 I'll put a bump on the curve right at the, at the point where it's gonna, um, we call it the resonant point. 
and then I'll start taking high end off. I'll hit like seven, eight, 10 K, whatever. Yeah. And, the, and the song just sits in the mix like crazy. And, but you have to have that little bump at the point where the, they call it the resonance point. A right? resonant peak, yeah. Um, you know, it, it seems counterintuitive to me because uh, you would think if you want to have like a guitar solo cut through a track, you'd want to add some more top end to it. But a lot of times if you take that take top end away, it makes it more confined and compact and yeah. you can push it Acoustics up higher. Acoustics too, acoustic guitars. Too. Acoustic guitars, tambourines, anything I that's think, super I, bright. I think there must be some kind of psychological component that, that, that allows you to hear the frequency that defines a particular sound. Mm -hmm. uh, like mm -hmm. for example, a mother's hearing is tuned to the frequency of a baby's cry. Mm -hmm. So if you don't want your girlfriend or wife to wake up, just, hey. I'm gonna go out with the guys and drink some beer tonight. And they won't wake up, but if you hey, I wanna go out with the guys and drink some beer, they'll wake right up. This, so is, I, this is why you're divorced. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not I'm divorced. Gonna, I'm gonna use that though. Because, <laughs> but don't give him credit. But, but, but my point is, besides being silly, is that there's a frequency in an acoustic guitar that we associate with an acoustic guitar, so mm -hmm. everything else doesn't contribute when it's in combined with a bunch of other sounds. Well, and to the other point you make, that I, you know, Two, two act, musical axioms I used to always watch and see what you guys think. Genius is in simplicity. Oh, it's yeah. not in being complicated. Yeah. And oftentimes you get to that with subtraction, not necessarily addition, and knowing, mm -hmm. knowing where to edit and pull back. And that, that applies. I saw Tim Cook interviewed, and he said, we spent all of our time at Apple just figuring out how to edit down as opposed to do more. You know, so you're really targeted and so on and so forth. So I think about like when you when you read about the Beatles and four tracks. I mean, mm -hmm. basically at some point the the guitar stops and then there's a gap and then they put the tambourine in the gap and then the guitar would start again. So you start thinking, well, I don't really need a tambourine from top to bottom. Right. I mm -hmm. specifically played this tambourine in this space right here, mm -hmm. and I kind of try to think about mixing like that as well mm -hmm. because it. Mm -hmm. It really does come to frequency. You put the bass and the tambourine on the same channel. You want more bass, you add low end. You mm -hmm. want more tambourine, you add more top end. So the, it just has become a lot easier to continuously record top to bottom and then sort through it later. So almost the, the mixer has become the producer in a way. Now, when you guys when you guys do that, sorry. You, you <laughs> Where do I take that You had that long breath rip? intake. I didn't know. I was like, you were going to blow lately the house I've been down. doing land or two lately. I've been doing um, so I'm doing all sorts of noises I've never done in my life before. Try to try to edit those for now okay. for the show. But when you guys do, when you're thinking through this process, are you thinking about radio or just the song being great? Me personally, mm -hmm. I, I never think about radio because mm -hmm. I don't associate anything I ever do will ever get played on the radio. I gotcha. just it just gets a lucky decision, you know, at some point. But just it's the, the song great. serves you serve the song and then. It could always be yeah. done better. For me, for me, it's it's a little more arrogant. Um, I'm a child of radio because I grew up on radio, mm -hmm. so it, it's who I am. So I just make a record I like, and it seems like a few million people like it too. I mean, but I do I do think about radio. Yeah, yeah, because we talk about it all the time. Not so much in terms of the creative things heard, but more in terms of the technical things like. Like, are they going to speed it up? Like some radio stations try to get an extra commercial in every hour by speeding your mix up. So mm -hmm. am I going to be sounding good there? Or they, they, they use these weird compressors. Yeah. And I used to own one just so I could see how that does. Mm -hmm. So you want to make sure that you're optimized for your MP3, your mm -hmm. MFIT, or Master Fry tunes. And, and you're also hired for different things. Yeah. Like some people come to you specifically because I get the calls and say, yeah. we need a radio mix for this. Yeah, and I do that a lot. So, you know, and some might be saying, I want this to shred. Or, or, we used to do like, okay, a single mix. You know, this yeah. is going to be the first single. So you, you inevitably put less bottom on it and turn the vocal up more, make it a little brighter or more yeah. accessible. But mm -hmm. like even on the Slipknot record, yeah. they wanted a more radio friendly version. Yeah. Um, so Seems that, like the internet kind of, ru not ruined, but kind of wiped out a lot of that stuff. It's like, you don't have to worry about three and a half minutes anymore. You don't have to worry about 18 minutes aside. You don't well, everybody's about... DIY. You can put out yeah. music now and you can yeah. go do your thing and you know, good, bad, and different and all that. That's a separate discussion, but yeah. you yeah. now have the freedom to be Her, your own uh, standard. I've got record. a public service announcement. Okay, PSA time. I was, uh, I was over at the PETA website, uh -huh. animal website, uh -huh. and uh, Joe very quietly won an award. He actually recorded a dog on the Melvin's record. Okay. Describe that, Joe. Well, uh, <laughs> OK, 
Okay. Okay. Well, I feel like you're about we, uh, to be compromised. <laughs> what was the dog doing that he recorded? Well, Joe's going to tell us. Okay, great. We, uh, it's a great Garth, song, too. Garth Richardson and I worked on a Melvin. We worked on a couple of Melvin's records, but this particular one was done at Henson, and, and it was very experimental. <laughs> and those guys, were like my first. asked the dog that question. <laughs> yeah. The dog just happened to be, it was Garth's dog, Mel, okay. and he, uh, he was a, a yellow lab, and he was on the couch. And we were really influenced by some of Jason Cassaro's um, detuning of toms on Power Station with the harmonizers. Sure. And, and Garth was in the subharmonic generators, and we were twisting knobs and everything. And, and the dog is laying there, and, and we thought, why not give the dog some food and put the microphone near his mouth or in his mouth and tickle his belly and see what kind of sounds come tickle out. Tickle his belly, Joe? Well, you know. Well, what, do you, what, well, what constitutes Joe's belly? Joe's other dog responded to the sound sexually <laughs> yeah, from time to time. And that song got recorded. That, that it's, was called, recorded. it's called Willie Rollbar. Sweet Willie Rollbar. And, <laughs> and I put the Melvin's record on and my old dog Bullet would actually come running to the speakers. <laughs> And just sit in front of the console and look at the speakers. The like, video of Bullet being turned on running to the oh, speakers. Oh, it was so <laughs> good. <laughs> it, it was so Sorry, Joe's never going to speak to us again. Yeah. Sorry, Joe. It's universal language of love. <laughs> yeah. so, you know, I snuck that one in on that's, uh, it. Okay, Joe, I'll give you a straight one. That's creative. M mastering is a whole different thing now than it was five years ago. Um, uh, what's your approach towards mastering? Are you Are you trying to get into that territory when you finish a mix and leave a little less for the, for the guys to do? Or are you trying to give them what they need to do or combinations depending on projects? Um, I, I learned a lesson a long time ago that if it's not almost mastered, that they assume the mix is terrible. So The client. The client, I yeah. Agree. So I you agree. have to get it to a certain point um, at the same time, if you maximize it completely and you take it to a professional mastering person, they can't do anything to it, but they might try, they usually do, right. and it might make it worse. So what I, what I personally like to do is I, I'll try mastering type plugins on my mix. Mm -hmm. As I'm mixing, I might spend the next 30 minutes with something on there just so I can hear what mastering might do to mm -hmm. it. And it really does bring out, maybe my hi-hat's too loud, or maybe my drums are too mm -hmm. squeezed. and. But I still do like to give the mastering person some headway, and I choose mastering based on the project and sure. what that person brings to the table. Yeah, one, one of the things I'm, I'm thinking, I'm, in fact, we discussed this yesterday, uh, I'm big fans of Lander, and I think the concept of mastering is completely different. If you think about why we mastered records, it was to go from a piece of tape to a piece of vinyl. So the mastering engineer had to make sure it could fit on 18 minutes yeah. aside, couldn't be too much low end, too much right. top end, or the needle would skip. Right. Had to EQ it for vinyl. And now that need doesn't exist. So some mastering engineers haven't gotten that, haven't gotten that uh, memo yet. So it's, I think it's okay for us to give it to them fairly finished, but let them be a safety net. Let them... Yeah. Help us with frequencies if we're in a new place, but also, um, um, if if they think they can make an EQ change that's going to improve it, I want to hear that, you know. And I think that's why companies like Lander have an advantage now, is because they've they've got that ability to to add something to what we've done as opposed to make it fit well, a piece of vinyl. And you also, know? you can control it. You can go yeah. try it, see what it is, adjust it, come back, play yeah. around with it at a point, at a cost point that's not crazy. And, and then at the end of the day, if you still want to go to the specialist and so forth, mm -hmm. you can do that. I, I like the, um, I, I mean, personally, I don't think I'm a good mixer. I just mix, and I think it sounds good yeah, to good me mixer. at this yeah. point. But, like, I give it to somebody else, and I think they just, they put the icing on the cake for me. I kind of built the mm -hmm. cake. I need someone else to stand to, back to, and go. Right. Yeah. That's what you I know, like, I, that objective ear. That, yeah. that third eye is really good. Because it... It really does make a difference. Chongster, you got some questions over there from the audience? I got some really good ones. What do you have? This is from Dan Clark. When it comes to recording and layering guitars, what kind of experimental things have you done to get a different sound or tone? And how do you also feel about amp modeling software today? Hmm. Uh, that's a good question, actually. Um, I am a big fan of, of listening to some of those earlier sessions and hearing direct guitars. Hmm. And the direct guitar always seems to stick out to me. So when I... When I have a, a record, a big rock record, it has a ton of thick guitars. I'll experiment with DI guitars as well. Mm -hmm. And some of it might involve a straight up direct box with 
you know, some scuff man or something weird like that or, yeah. or you know, plug in. And some of it is actually just recording um, through speaker simulators. So as opposed to miking up a cabinet and getting all the air, I'm adding more of the direct sound. Mm. And, and that's usually how I'll layer and um, that'll really make the sound jump a bit. Give us another one. This is Olaf Bergen. How do you find a reference point for a mix that you didn't track? Um, well, I, I'm a firm believer in communication, first of all, and I think the whole idea of doing kind of test mixes is really bizarre to me because if you wake up one day and decide this is good or bad, I, I, I don't think Jimmy Page ever walked into Olympic and said we're going to give uh, you know Glenn Johns or right. Andrew Johns a, a test. They said this is what Led Zeppelin sounds like. Can you help Let's us achieve this. that? And yeah. So for me, um, I, I, you know, I, I always... I buy CDs, I listen to music. If I'm going to work on your record, I'm going to buy everything that you've done. I'm going to talk to you and ask you what you loved and hated and where you want to go with it. Mm -hmm. And if I can bring anything to the table, and that's really the most important Plus, thing. if nobody shows up, you put the pictures of them uh, around, uh, don't you? But, well, I, I, I try to study yeah. what you're into. I like yeah. to get people on the phone, you know. Just, I'm mixing a, a record right now, and I talk to the guys on the phone. We had a conference call. What did you like? What did you hate? Yeah. What are you going for on this record? Where do I fit in this record? We, we do that as a pre-call before every mix. Mm -hmm. We call it the creative conversation, yeah. and just set helps so set much. parameters and expectations and technical stuff and deadlines. Back in the day, the car was a place you'd go from yeah. the studio to the car and listen. Yeah, that's and, so true. And it was sort of a marketplace stuff. Do you still use the car that way? I, I don't use it as much because I had a. 93 Nissan Pathfinder that had the greatest stereo ever and, and when that thing replace, died man. it never sounded the same and then my new car sucks it's not, and I'm uh, like, it's, do you remember um, and m used to have a car outside yes remember I yeah think, we used to broadcast think, uh, and go sit in the car yeah, and yeah that's what, what I was about to like. hear about it was like a, a roadster or something I don't remember the car but I remember you had to tune into a certain frequency and you're like okay play the mix because yeah. you had tie lines from the studio yeah. into the car and people would go out and sit in the car in the back and judge yeah. their mixes I made a I made my own transmitter I made an FM transmitter and I think legally you can do like one or two watts I did like a couple of hundred <laughs> and so I could I could have my clients I think I did it with you mm -hmm. I, I could let them start listening on the radio like 10 miles away. Oh, that's awesome. And I got a little call from the FCC, the studio did, and they, they didn't <laughs> say anything nasty or anything, very polite. But, but, you, but you did I stop. dialed it back a little yeah, bit. Just, just a tad. <laughs> Down to 50 and watts. my antenna got hit by lightning and it couldn't use it anymore. <laughs> I'm, I drive an older car, it's a 2007, but I want to keep it because of the stereo. The yeah, stereo's got logic stereo in it. The really good. Oh, it's sick. If I wasn't huffing gasoline out of my Nissan, it was, <laughs> I would still own it, man. It was the greatest stereo. 93 Nissan Pathfinder. Right, we've all huffed Phenomenal. at one point in time in our life. How's your arm? Is it loose? It's time for batter's box. I yeah, want to see I, know. You throw, I am so ready for Joe. Throw a couple of pitches. Yeah, he's he's soft-spoken, and those are the athletes that are soft-spoken and often clean your clock. You know, you kind of can't, you don't see them coming. Are you ready? I am ready. Are you loose? I'm loose. You this, need this, some I mean, I'm going to concede to Joe before I start. Oh, well, no, don't do that, man. That's not Pensati. I'm, I might, I might Act bring, like you're going to I win. might bring you in in the fourth. Okay, we'll cool. See. cool. Let me loosen up. <laughs> All right, let's start batter's box and roll them out, DP. Reverb. Oh, late the um, Dynacord. Ooh. Ooh. Ooh, Ooh he's good. Ooh, he's good. good. Really good. The top, yeah. Really good. Yeah. Uh, I love their Leslie similar too. Um, twin. Fender. Mm. Bass. Tube Screamer. Ooh. The Eye. Um, I call it the crazy guy from New Jersey DI. It's a hand built from a guy named Robert Derby, Valvatronics. <laughs> oh, wow. Phase. Um, wow. Well, Phase tester. <laughs> Overheads. Violet Amethyst Vintage. Damn. Damn, he's good. You want to just concede? Or you no, no, go I, got, I got a couple ones. Okay, good. Celestians. Greenback 25. Ooh. He, he blew that. It's, it's 30 watt Creamback. Okay. Creamback. Creamback. Square watts. off. All right. That came Death out of match. the Marshall Major cabinet. Okay. Stereo bus. Sontech. Mm. Ooh, that was a good one. Vocals. U67. Synthesizers. I only have a Moog Little Fatty. Mm. 
if your studio caught fire and nobody is better equipped to answer this question than Joe Barisi. He's got a lot of decisions uh, in to fact, make. In fact, don't count it against him if you can't think of one right, piece of gear you, to you. save on the way out. Got can't you. be your dog, can't be your your your, your uh, computer, your hard drive, right now. A piece on of gear. Way out. Oh. Sov Tech MiG 50. Wow. Oh, you ain't Ooh. got to say it, Herbie, no, my clock. Well, the other thing, too, is there's one adjustment. If, you know, in baseball, they now have a review. Mm. So there's one little review we have to do because when we talked on the phone and I said, you said what, something about twin or Fender twin. Fender twin. Yeah. yeah, well, he had said that was his sexual preference in terms of <laughs> twin, but, but he tried to wow. clean it up for the show, so we'll pass on that review. Came a little forward. late there, closer. Well, I, like, well like, you were so beat, I didn't want to come in oh, and just take the to, L. Uh, yeah. yeah, I was going to take the L. Man, thanks for the vote of confidence. Uh, well, listen, the, the thing about Joe, one, from being a friend of the show, because early on, Joe has always been there for us. Um, we try to do the same. What I love is the juxtaposition between who he is as a person and just the power of his records. Joe, oh, yeah. Joe will hit you like this. He's like he's so smooth. musical. His records are musical, and then the and the records are musical, but they don't. You know, I like Rock Edge, so oftentimes I'm the older black guy in the car who pulls up, and you know, kids are like, and I've got ACDC jamming and shit, and they're like, da 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 da. The, the power of it is what I really, and what I love about Exciting. what you do is that you never sacrifice. You find the musicality. And you keep the juice so that you can feel that. Because you have to feel rock. Like, you can't yeah, just hear it. These, uh, I try to listen to it as a, as a listener. I mean, I'm mixing, yeah. but I'm still trying to think, am I excited by this at the end of the day? And mm -hmm. if I'm not, then I'm probably not going to work on it again after that. So if we drag you around to some of our live events and our panels and stuff, would we just annoy the hell out of you? Or would you? Would no, you? I would love it. Um, we should do that, right? Yeah. Well, based on the way he cleaned your clock. I want, I, I want, a, I want a closet to sleep in over at... Uh, <laughs> you and Chongor are just Barisi fanboys. Yeah, but, no, man, that, that's man, I would love to record something with you guys one day because oh, we're okay. talking about tuning drums and yeah. setting up minimal approach. And Let's do that. It really is about using your ears. I mean, it doesn't mm. really take gear. It takes your ears. We should do some more of these ITLs and exclusive stuff with him. I think so, too. Sure. Or For maybe... Sure. Yes. Yeah, absolutely. Oh, you know, he would actually be a great offer. I know. We'll have that conversation okay. as well, too. Um, the time just goes fast. It's never enough. Never enough. Can we have you back at some point in time? Any just, time. It's a pleasure. Always. Just lay on you all the time, because that, that's manna from heaven for our audience. And in the rock space, when you get the guys who have real DNA, it's incredible. Pensado Awards coming up. I'll get your calendar early. Don't move. you got to be on the pro committee, all the stuff you always do for us. Um, we love you, man. Thank you so much. Thanks for having me. DP, take us home. Okay, guys, I'm going to do something a little different today with Joe. Um, I always tell you in the end to the layers, now don't just copy what I'm telling you, but use your imagination and make it your own and, and copy the concept. I'm going to give you a concept that Joe uses that's brilliant and elegant, and I want you to, to expand this to a lot of things that make sense. Tell them how you take two different microphones and put them in phase on a guitar amp? Um, I, I think um, the purest way of doing something like that is to plug your guitar into your head or amp, turn it up so you get some noise coming out of it. You have to make sure nobody actually plays some the hiss. guitar, it'll blow your head off. But if you got that hiss going and you take your first microphone and you place it in a spot where you think it's good or you might have already listened to it and put it in a spot, mm -hmm. Then you go to the preamp on the second microphone, flip it out of phase, so now it's in a null spot. And you put your headphones on and go stand in front of that amplifier and you move that second mic and move it to a spot where it is the quietest. Where it cancels. Where so it cancels. It's completely out of phase now. At that point it's completely or as close as you can get out of phase with the first microphone and then you, when you go back in the control room and you flip the phase on that mic pre, and now and they're, they're, they're both in perfectly wow. in the... Not that perfectly in phase is always great. It right. is right. really it's just a starting spot. point. Uh, one more from me. Tell us about your event and how people can sign in one more time. Um, our, my, um, our workshop's going to be splitting guitars, and it's basically that. It's getting microphones in phase, using multiple guitar amps, and getting a bigger guitar sound, and making sure they're in phase as well. And, I mean, it comes down to showing you how to test stuff, but it really comes down to getting DIs and, and uh, amplifiers together, two amps, and it's just anything to do with splitting guitars, splitting sounds, using... Silent Sisters and Rock Crushers and DI recording. And, and the date's what date? Uh, it's May 14th. May 14th, and yeah. they enter where? On ProSoundWorkshop.com. 
We'll say goodnight, Dad. I'll be there. Cool. Good night, guys. Thank you. Thank you.